views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello, welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, we'll give you an update on what's been going on right here in the borough of the Bronx. Plus, President Trump threatens North Korea, promising fire and fury. Words never used before by a sitting president. The rhetoric of the president has many people worry if the U.S. is facing a major threat. We'll discuss more with our political commentator. After that, we'll hear an organization or hear from an organization that helps to raise funds for those unable to make bail. Then we're going to sit down with a representative from the Mental Health Association of NYC to help bring awareness to mental health. And then lastly, we'll hear about a business expo that will help expand business and clientele right here in the borough of the Bronx. Stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Because right now, we're officially open. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, August 9th. Of course, you're watching Open, a live program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. Now, we want to encourage you to stay connected to us. You can find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has been going on over the past week, but we're going to catch you up right now with a few Bronx updates. Ted Brock's housing developments will soon be receiving a new facelift. $7 million in capital funding will go to housing developments across the Bronx, creating more than a 1,500 affordable units right here in our borough. Now, as a part of the plan, it will include $500,000 to be awarded to new destiny housing that will house domestic violence survivors and $750,000 for second farm housing, a project that will help the formerly homeless in partnership with Catholic Charities. The announcement was made by Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. as part of his capital budget initiative, who said, quote, This year's allocations will help a wide range of individuals find and keep an affordable home. I look forward to continuing to build on these great successes in our housing sector as our borough continues its positive transformation. One other news, Governor Andrew Cuomo is awarding more than $7 million in grants to a variety of colleges around New York State, who offer college courses to prisoners. The Cuomo administration says that the plan will create a, well, should create classes for about 2,500 inmates that will be financed from money from large bank settlements. Now, the governor has been eager to expand educational programs in prisons, saying that about 1,000 inmates currently take college-level classes. Under the Cuomo's education plan, the colleges include Cornell University, New York University, Mercy College, Medall College, Mohawk Valley Community College, and Jefferson Community College, offering classes in 17 state prisons around New York State. Prisoners in the program will have the opportunity to obtain a bachelor or an associate degrees, and inmates with long sentences will not be eligible. Courses are set to start in September and will cover a wide range of subjects, including math, science, and philosophy. Well, as part of Breastfeeding Week, city officials unveiled five lactation pods installed in five public buildings that will offer new mothers a comfortable place to nurse in all five boroughs. Now, the 20,000 pods were placed in neighborhoods where rates of breastfeeding aren't encouraged, according to Health Commissioner Dr. Mary Bassett. The lactation pod for eight of those stations include a bench, a changing table, and an electrical outlet for breast pumps, and a locked door for privacy. The Bronx Zoo is one of the areas in the Bronx that does have a lactation pod for mothers to use. Now, to find a lactation pod or a public breastfeeding room, visit the DOH's website. Well, Mira Bill de Blasio is proposing a new plan called a millionaire's tax, hoping to help fix the New York City subway system. The millionaire's tax would, uh, what well, I should say, tax about 32,000 people in the city 
warrant about a half a million dollars a year. And if the plan goes through, legislation would generate $700 million a year. The money would go directly to the state's Metropolitan Transit Authority for them to further invest bonds for capital projects and allow them to fund $8 billion in capital investments. Now, the other half of the money would pay for half-price metro cards for around 80,000 New Yorkers living below the poverty line. Many officials, such as MTA Chairman Joe Loda, think the plan is a good idea, but still feels that the MTA needs a short-term emergency financing plan now. Well, we'll keep you updated on what's happening for the MTA right here on Open, so make sure that you stay connected to us. In other news, the Office of the Oath of Administration of Trials and Hearings held a recent outreach at Orchard Beach, informing people that the NYPD could now write civil summonses instead of criminal summonses for low-level offenses. Our Bronx Net reporter, Arlie Makoko, was there, and she brings us the story right now. We're just giving out information about what to do if you get a city-issued summons. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Outreach at the beach is what they're calling it. The Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings were at Orchard Beach this week to announce that the NYPD has the authority to file administrative summonses in their courts, also known as oath, rather than at criminal court for low-level offenses like open container, excessive noise, and being in a park after dark. We want to uh, make sure that people understand what their uh, options are, what their rights are, what the effect is of these summonses. They are real summonses. They are not to be ignored. For this reason, Oath expects to receive approximately 140,000 additional summonses, and they say they're prepared. Either go online and you can upload your, uh, your evidence or just mm -hmm. type in whatever it is that uh, your, your uh, defense is. Okay. And uh, when you do that, in a, within about five days, you get a response by email mm -hmm. of what the decision is. And the other easy way is to do it by phone. You can call in and ask for a hearing by phone, and you'll be given a time and date where you'll get a phone call from a hearing officer uh, together with the enforcement officer if he's available, and you can uh, give him your, your story and like that. And of course, you can always come to a, to a, a hearing center and, and go through the normal process. In the Bronx, that address is 3033rd Avenue near East 156th Street. Aside from paying the fine, there's also another option. Community service, the way we look at it, is not the classical community service. It's actually for the benefit mostly of, say, a young kid who can't uh, really afford to pay a $300 fine or something like that. I mean, a $25 fine, most, which is most of them, is not that big a deal, but... To a, a young kid, that might be, mean something. The change comes as a result of the Justice Reform Act signed by the mayor last year that went into effect in June this year. Staffers were out handing out pamphlets to make sure everyone is aware. So why choose Orchard Beach? The most common summons that's issued by the New York City Police Department, that's not a criminal summons, is open container. Open container is simply somebody is out in the open, yeah. Uh, not in a, in a restaurant or in their house, with an open uh, container that contains alcohol. That's a violation. They issue well over 100,000 summonses for that every year. In the end, it's all about keeping the fun in summer. Something like an open container can be $25, or you can decide to do community service. For Ronxnet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. Looks like she had a great time out there on the beach. Well, listen, we're taking a quick break. We'll be back with more show. Stay with us. We'll come right back right after this.
They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're gonna take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, I am a witness and so are you. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. Most party fouls are pretty dumb. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving, the ultimate party foul. Well, during a photo op at the Trump National Golf Club in Bedminster, New Jersey, Trump warned North Korea, stating, North Korea best not make any more threats, quote now, to the United States because they will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Now, these remarks came hours after reports that North Korea escalated their nuclear program. North Korea has threatened to send missiles to Guam, causing what some might say a major problem. Now, joining us to discuss the president's comments and more, we welcome now our political commentator and the owner of Retro Visit Media, Lee Bynes, and uh, good to have you. Good to be back. Uh, as we were talking last week, uh, we were talking about what the president says and how the president says actually triggers worldwide uh, attention. These mm -hmm. comments now are very stern. Uh, and some people feel as though it's over the top. I'd say the word I'd use would be incendiary simply because of the fact that, uh, well, uh, what most people may not realize is that the conflict between the United States and North Korea goes back 70 years. The war that we had with them never really ended. It, that war was stopped uh, through an armistice. An armistice means like, look, we just agree to stop shooting at each other. Hence, we have this uh, DMZ that's been set up in, in effect for the, uh, the, the demilitarized zone, has been in effect for the length of that time. Um, all of the preceding presidents up until now have found a way to uh, keep uh, the rhetoric from getting that uh, stern, if, if you will. But uh, Donald Trump, in, in my estimation, has crossed the line by setting up a red line of his own by, you know, making the statement that if uh, North Korea continues to threaten the United States or threaten uh, the U.S. allies in the region, that uh, you would get this uh, fire and uh, Well, let's uh, talk fury. about the other elephant in the room. That's the, 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 the actual rhetoric comes based on classified information that was allegedly leaked. Uh, now, you've got some people who are saying, the president can declassify whenever he wants to declassify. Mm -hmm. But you have other people who are saying that this is something that he spoke specifically against in his campaign. Well, he's been speaking uh, about the, uh, the, the, the difficulty with leaks, not only throughout his campaign, but uh, throughout the, his entire administration thus far. For him to retweet uh, classified information completely uh, sets things on its head. But the point I want to make uh, right now, and one of the reasons why we're talking about this, is because uh, we're at an extremely heightened level of, uh, of uh, tension with North Korea. North Korea, in my estimation, our analysis uh, bears out the fact that they are not going to back down on this. Uh, Pyongyang uh, has, uh, or uh, Kim Jong-un has uh, determined that the only way to keep the United States at bay is to have a nuclear program and a very, very strong, robust one. Uh, he just uh, crossed uh, Donald Trump's red line when he made that statement of uh, fire and fury. Uh, about 35 minutes after he made that statement, uh, North Korea was threatening Guam. Uh, there's uh, a tremendous, we have a, a lot of uh, military assets in Guam right now. Uh, the North Koreans have the uh, capabilities of striking it. Whether they'll do that, uh, make good on that threat is difficult to say, but it put the president in an awkward position of now what, it's, what does he do? Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't know where that goes from here. I can say this though, um, based on my own analysis, I find that uh, uh, North Korea has the upper hand in this, 100%, because South Korea, Seoul, uh, is the 16th largest uh, city in the world, uh, population of a little bit more than 20 million. Uh, they are right next door I mean, less than 
Westchester County away uh, with uh, uh, conventional weapons targeted, to, targeted upon them. Um, if the United States decides to uh, uh, strike pr preemptively, uh, North Korea will respond and they will respond with everything they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, South Korea would be placed in a position where they have to, def to, to finish and, and or fight that war. Uh, let me move out of foreign policy for a minute. Sure. I want to talk about local policy. Because sure. One of the things the president did talk about was uh, how he was going to address opiate uh, opiate use and the use of opiate, talking about pretty much that law enforcement will be the abiding factor in this. Well, you know what? Um, when that state, when he made that statement yesterday that he was going to go strong with law enforcement, he was going to look for longer sentences. Uh, uh, I, I, I just kind of bristled at that, but I wasn't surprised because uh, Jeff Sessions about two weeks ago mentioned the same mentioned the same thing, and that seems to be the way that the president is going to help ha handle this opiate crisis. Uh, why I find that a little bit difficult to, uh, to, to swallow is because uh, he put together a, a commission headed up by Governor Christie, and Governor Christie uh, mm -hmm. came out with re recommendations that this was a health care crisis and needed to be health, uh, handled that way. But Donald Trump's approach goes back 30 years talking about the just say no, don't do dope from the beginning. Uh, I think that's an a antiquated idea, a failed idea or, uh, to, to go back to the so-called war on drugs. We've seen the outcome of that. Um, rather than find ways to get these people in treatment, uh, we're going to uh, put them in a position where now they're going to be criminals. So now not only are these, these folks addicted, uh, but now they have a criminal record to go with it. So even if they do find a way to uh, uh, get themselves together later on, now you can't find a job because you got a felony, a felony uh, drug condition, uh, uh, conviction. And um, I, I just see that to be extremely disturbing, and I don't see it being positive, you know, moving in the, in the uh, right direction. Um, if anything, uh, I, would, I would think that the president would do well by going after the drug companies, the ph big pharma, who put this stuff into the, uh, into the uh, medicals mainstream. Uh, I would also go after a lot of the doctors and the pill mills who negligently allow these people to get hooked on this stuff without finding an avenue for them, getting them right into to treatment. See, after you have provided treatment to someone for their, for their pain and you realize these people have gone a little bit too far, isn't there a responsibility on the medical provider to get this person some treatment rather than just leave them out into the street and they'll find their own ways to, to remedicate themselves? And we also, we know how that works. Uh, give us your take on the Senate. Obviously, it took time to take a break with health care crisis or the health the healthcare. Uh, if we bill. got a minute, could I just jump on that really, really yeah. fast? Because last week we talked about uh, uh, the president could allow this uh, uh, Obamacare to implode. Uh, how he intended to do that was simply don't pay. Um, right now, the, the background on that story is, is that two years ago, uh, when Barack Obama put the subsidies in place so people low income could afford to actually access health care in the first place, uh, the House sued uh, the Barack Obama administration. Barack Obama lost. The judge was going to let that, um, uh, that, that lawsuit go through, and then uh, the Obama administration filed an appeal against it. So that, that, that uh, lawsuit was, was stayed until the next administration, which is Donald Trump. The only thing Donald Trump has to do to let uh, 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 Obamacare fail is just don't make that next payment that's made in, uh, I believe, at the end of September. Right now, uh, if, if those, if those, uh, those uh, payments aren't made to the insurance companies, they will continue to, to, to leave the marketplace. Uh, people in this community and uh, throughout the, the, uh, the country will start getting letters that let them know that either you no longer qualify for Obamacare or if you do and you are in the individual market, your premiums are going to be going up, your co-payments are going to be going up, and your deductibles are, uh, are going to be going up sky high, and uh, that's going to create uh, a, a significant amount of disaster. Now, there are two uh, senators. It's a bipartisan effort. I believe it's Patty Murray out of Washington and uh, Lamar Alexander out of uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. They're getting together and trying to put something together to make sure that those subsidies are uh, given out to the insurance companies to keep what's coming from happening. However, again, like you said, everybody's on vacation. Now, yeah, and, and, let me, uh, and let me cut in here. With absolutely. the vacation going there, how much do you think the White House is doing a lot of campaigning 
to really get this uh, this uh, bill passed? I don't think that they're doing anything right now. That's this whole big brouhaha with the fact that the president is on vacation. The president is not on vacation. The president is in defense mode because he's worrying about the uh, Mueller investigation that's that's uh, going on around him. He's worrying about news reports that came out that they had to tamp down really really fast about uh, uh, Mike Pence and his shadow. Uh, campaign uh, that's been running in the background and uh, I can't think that with, with that going on the president's sinking polling numbers he's down to uh, I believe a 73 percent of the population do not trust him so the, with the credibility gap going on uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of uh, the Senate uh, his own GOP mm -hmm. uh, are starting to uh, to break ranks with him they're starting to see an opening and they're starting to think that well maybe this president is so uh, out of step with with the rest of the country actually quite frankly with the rest of the world that they need to have options uh, for themselves and that's one of the reasons why you will see uh, people uh, gearing up to uh, primary this man. Lee Bynes that's why we bring you here every week. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Our political commentator Lee Bynes taking a quick break. Listen when we return we'll be back with more shows. Stay with us. Coming right back. Every time I hear the alarm bell go off in school, I think it's an air raid. A lot of houses in our neighborhood have been destroyed. I like to close my ears and sing songs whenever the bombs come close. I'm worried our new neighbors won't like us. But I know it's all going to be worth it. I just want my family to be safe. But these are not my these words. These are not my words. These are not my words. Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Thinking about inspirational quotes. You gotta believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise, Louise, can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at getschool.com. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. According to reports from the New York Post, in 2016, an average of nearly 4,000 prisoners were left behind bars because they simply couldn't make bail. Well, the Bronx Freedom Fund is organization is about raising funds and keeping clients out of jail as they wait for trial. Now, here to tell us more about the organization, we welcome the project director from the Bronx uh, Freedom Front, Ezra Richin, and we thank you so much for coming to share with us. Thanks for having me, Darren. Good. So let's talk about this here because it's uh, some people feel this is good, mm -hmm. other people feel it's controversial, but you guys are really bailing people out, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in the borough of the Bronx, more than 1,000 people? Yeah, we bailed out more than 1,000 people in the Bronx alone. What's the basis for why you feel this is important? Well, I think there's a, a couple reasons. The first is, is about the legal grounding for the pretrial system. So in our system, you're innocent until proven guilty. Um, but what happens if you can't pay bail is that you get sent to either Rikers Island in the Bronx, uh, which is known as, you know, also known as Torture Island. It's one of the most notoriously violent jails in the country. It's called our little Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, or your other option is you're sent to what's called the boat. It's a military barge that was brought up from New Orleans and housed off of Hunts Point in the Bronx between the Department of Sanitation and a wholesale fish market. And that houses another 900 men. We're putting people on a, on a, on a boat or on an island. And those are the options uh, for people who cannot pay bail. While they are presumed innocent in the eyes of the law, they're sitting uh, in some of the most violent jails in the country. But how do you argue against those people who say, listen, bail is used also to really hold somebody who really, you mm -hmm. know, as a system that, that may really need to be held? Right, so I think the, the theoretical grounding of bail is that if you put up some money, then uh, you'll have some skin in the game. So if you show up to all your court dates, you'll get that money back and it'll be like an incentive for you to come back to your court dates. Mm -hmm. uh, our results kind of uh, flip that theory on its head because our clients do not have any money on the line. It's our money on the line and not theirs. Uh, so they don't have that monetary incentive to come back to court. Right. But what happens is 95% of our clients come back to all of their court dates. And in one of the most backlogged courts in the country, that can be you know, 15, 20 court dates over many years. Uh, so that kind of proves that money is not necessary as an incentive for returning to court. What we do is provide timely phone reminders, text messages, and things along those lines to make people aware of their court dates uh, and support them pre-trial. How do you make the choice of who mm -hmm. uh, that, you, that, you're, that you're gonna give this, uh, you know, bail out? That's a great question. So we're uh, limited by New York State law to providing bail for people who are accused of misdemeanors. Uh, which is the lower level uh, of charges, and when bail is set at $2,000 or less. So that's our kind of first big uh, limitation from the state. Um, and after that, we're looking for people who uh, have ties to the local community uh, in the Bronx and you know, have families here, have jobs here, and uh, also people who we think are, are therefore likely to come back to court. Because the way bail works is if you come back to your court dates, you get the money back. So what right. happens is we will provide bail for someone who can't afford it, they'll come back to all their court dates and we'll take those funds at the end and use it to assist someone else who's also caught uh, in this situation. So you just, so pretty much $2,000 and then those people who have misdemeanors are mm -hmm. the ones who, 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 are, who are categorized. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you put this out there to help people, what's the response you get? Uh, it's an overwhelmingly positive response because I think people don't truly understand the way that our system works. I think we all believe in the presumption of innocence, that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. Uh, but what happens in the South Bronx is a, for people who have bail set at $1,000 or less, so you know, for some people that's a trip to an ATM machine, but for people in the South Bronx who have bail set at $1,000 or less, 86% of them will end up going to jail for their inability to pay that bail. And I don't think people understand that it's these small amounts of money that are, that are really determining who is and who isn't in jail while people are presumed innocent in the eyes of the law. So as you've worked, as you said, it's mandated by New York State and New York State has mm -hmm. assisted in this. Talk to us about you know, that, that component and what the state has said and how mm -hmm. others have uh, really chimed in in this. Yeah, so I think the reaction from the state has been uh, a positive one. We've seen the, the law pass that allows us to pay bails of $2,000 or less for misdemeanors, and there's uh, legislators out there who want to expand the reach of, of bail funds. I think um, what we're really doing is, is kind of uh, acting as a mirror for the system to, to show these are the people who are being kept in jail and, and trying to see, as you mentioned, 4,000 people on Rikers Island who can't pay bail are housed there. Every year it's about 40,000 people who are held in, bail on, who are held in jail on, on bail because they can't afford uh, a payment. So I think what we're doing is, is kind of showing uh, the public and showing the state what the system is doing. So when you talk about the 40,000 that are actually held in jail uh, with, with, and can't afford bail, are these people with misdemeanor offenses or are these just Oh, the that's, grand total? that's the grand total. Okay, that's the grand total. So we don't yeah. know exactly how many are really with misdemeanor offenses. With misdemeanors, it's a smaller amount, but it's somewhere around 10,000 every year. Mm. And so as people are watching right now, somebody's saying, listen, I may, you know, how do I get assistance? Mm -hmm. what do I get? They may have a loved one or something. Right. What do they do? Right. So we get a lot of calls um, from Rikers Island. We get a lot of calls from uh, the boat. And we get a lot of calls from, from loved ones. The best course of action is to uh, talk to the attorney, because the attorney is the one who has the information and the access to, to uh, connect the families with us. Mm -hmm. And so they have the opportunity to do that, but and then afterwards you make a determination, is it a group, mm -hmm. how, does, how, does the, how does the selection process work? Well, it, it varies uh, case by case, but we work uh, as a unit, mm -hmm. um, and we try to work very quickly in, in uh, providing bail, because what happens is in those first few hours and days in jail uh, is when things really fall apart. So if you 
you know, have a mental health problem, I know we'll hear about mental health later in the segment, but uh, you might not get access to that medication during those first few hours and days in jail. If you uh, have a job and you don't show up for a few days because you're on Rikers unable to pay a $500 bail, you might end up uh, losing that job. Um, and if you're in a homeless shelter and you don't sign in for 24, 48 hours, then you might forfeit that space in the shelter and end up living on the street. So we try to uh, act quickly uh, to assist our clients. And so once again, I want to uplift, you said 96% of your clients actually do return for court. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, even though they don't have their own money on the right. line, they still, they still do that. And right. So I think a lot of people feel like, you know, if somebody else's money is on the line, <laughs> that I don't have to necessarily comply, mm -hmm. but you're saying that you're getting, you're getting that compliance. Right, and, and that compliance, I think, begs the question of why do we need this cash bail system that is unaffordable and keeps people in jail in the first place? If mm -hmm. you provide support to people, if you remind them about their court dates, uh, and you really treat them as human beings in a system that so often dehumanizes, then they will come back to court. And I think it really, as I, I said, raises the question of why we need this system in the first place. Are you optimistic that the system will change? Uh, I'm cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. that the system yeah. will change, yes. Is there reform on the way? Uh, I mean, what, was there, has there been some legal reform that you did? Yeah, so several, several states around the country uh, are in the process of uh, attempting to change their pretrial statutes, and some have, mm -hmm. uh, and New York State uh, might be doing that in 2018 in the next legislative session, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll continue to find out. Well, Ezra Richard, thank you so much for coming and sharing with Thanks us. Thanks for having uh, me. If people want more information, I guess they can go to the BronxFreedomForum.org, and that's yes. where they can find yeah. out. All right, so there you go. If you want more information, you can just go to BronxFreedomFund.org, and uh, you can get in touch with Ezra and his staff, and hopefully... Uh, get some answers and some possible assistance. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming to share with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Enlightening us. Listen, we want you to stay tuned because we're going to come back with more open. Stay tuned. We'll be right back right after this. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. It's totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on the sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys Did know? you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. So I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello, that's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant! Behold, the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Organizations like the Mental Health Association of New York City are providing many services for those affected by mental illness. Joining us now to discuss more and talk about this important issue, we welcome now the Vice President of Contact Center Services at the Mental Health Association of NYC, Anita Iyer, and thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Darren. When we talk about suicide, obviously, we many people didn't even know how prevalent it is mm -hmm. in, in, in our society, but 
when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, suicide is really, in many ways, preventable. Absolutely. I'm really glad you said that. Um, suicide is preventable. It is, the, it is rising na nationally as well as in New York City. Um, the rates of suicide are rising. Um, however, people can reach out for help. Um, we at the Mental Health uh, Association of New York City are really proud to be able to offer services that um, provide recovery-oriented care to individuals um, who are in need, who are experiencing um, emotional struggles, including suicidality, and connecting them to a wide range of services. Um, so we operate NYC Well, which I really want to highlight, which is a free and confidential 24-7 phone, text, and chat service mm -hmm. that's um, really pioneered. Um, our city leads the way in the country in offering this service um, uh, under the visionary leadership of our First Lady, Shirlene McRae, um, through the Thrive NYC program. Um, so individuals can call NYC Well, text us at 65173, um, or chat with us through our website and speak to a trained mental health professional who will engage with them, understand what's going on, assess whether they're experiencing um, any mental health or substance use related concerns, including suicidality, and connect them with a wide range of services um, that are available for resources for treatment as well as um, crisis intervention services. Let me ask a question about this because what are some of the reasons that we're seeing and the causes because as you talk about things rising, mm -hmm. is there a particular trend that we're not catching that we should be paying attention to? That's a great question. So nationally we've noted that um, the 45 individuals who are 45 to 64 years of age um, have really been the group that has shown the dr most dramatic r uh, rise in uh, suicide rates and that trend is pretty similar within New York City as well. Now, New York City um, actually is lower than the national average in terms of suicide rates. However, um, the only acceptable number of suicide deaths is zero. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of the reasons, and there are many reasons, suicidality, as, as is the case for any kind of emotional struggle, um, including suicidality, it's complex. There are multiple factors that really affect um, an individual's uh, emotions, um, innate factors as well as environmental factors. But certainly um, economic stress can place a huge uh, burden on individuals um, uh, in terms of how they manage and what's available to them. And there are also other barriers um, that prevent people from seeking or accessing care early enough. Um, so they sort of sit with their feelings, unable to really connect with someone who can support them. Stigma, stereotype, mm -hmm. a big a big factor mm -hmm. here. Because a lot of times when you talk about mental illness or mm -hmm. you talk about mental health, uh, a lot of people just sweep it under the rug because of the stigma mm -hmm. and the stereotype. Do you feel the barriers are being broken right now? Um, I think that um, you know Thrive NYC has done a really uh, phenomenal job in terms of trying to break some of those barriers, really by spreading awareness, um, making people understand that everyone experiences emotional struggles and that it's okay to reach out and try to connect with care. Um, and that's why the, um, you know, the impressive amount of advertising that's been put into NYC Well so people are aware that it's just one phone call or one click or one text away mm -hmm. to connect with a trained professional who can help you um, access the care that you need. And so for people who want to get care and people who may know someone who needs care, what, what would you recommend? I would tell them to call 1-888-NYC-WELL or text us at 65173 or chat with us. Um, they can access the chat portal by ac going to nyc.gov slash nycwell um, and speak with a trained professional or a peer support specialist, an individual who's experienced their own struggles who can help you, um, you know, sort of figure out what's going on and navigate through um, your own path. Um, and we can connect them with f uh, resources in their community close to their zip code. Um, uh, free resources as well as resources that they can access through their insurance um, and, and provide support or connect them to crisis intervention services. The effects of mental health, many people don't know the effects of mental health and unfortunately it doesn't play itself out sometimes until you get to the place of suicide mm -hmm. but uh, for people who don't know about some of those effects, what are they? Um, you know, mental health um, concerns can be varied um, and they can present themselves in multiple ways. It's um, complex, like I said. But if uh, someone is concerned about themselves or a loved one, um, they can certainly reach out to us and we can help them understand, help sort of assess what's going on, whether they're demonstrating any signs and symptoms um, that could be indicative of needing some more support. And we can certainly talk them through and collaborate in identifying some supports. Um, for those who are wondering about whether is my loved one struggling with suicidality? Some of the common symptoms are, um, you know, you 
uh, the changes in things that people say. If, if a loved one is talking about suicide or talking about finding ways to kill themselves or starting to give away their possessions as though they're pre preparing for death or isolating or withdrawing, these are all signs to pay attention to and reach out for help on their behalf or on behalf of themselves. Um, if they're noticing changes in their sleep patterns, like they're suddenly starting to sleep a lot or sleep too little, um, if they're suddenly more agitated or anxious or angry, um, if they're using substances more um, than they used to. Um, these are all things to pay attention to and um, if they reach out to us we can certainly collaborate with them in figuring out what's the right connection to care that could prevent them from getting to a place where um, they can't come back. What's the biggest misnomer about this whole, about this whole thing? About? Um, Suicide. You know, it, it's that um, there's nothing that we can do. It, it really is preventable. And if people reach out on behalf of themselves or someone else early enough, it is preventable. There is a lot that we can do um, to help the, the person that's in need. Because we watch a lot of celebrities and you hear mm -hmm. a lot of celebrities and you hear them. And, and the big question always becomes like, you look like you got it all together. You mm -hmm. look like you have it all. Mm -hmm. What happens and, mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the things? Because if it happens to a celebrity, and they perceive or it's perceived that they've got it all together mm -hmm. the other person who you know doesn't have the same amount of things you know it could all be the same yeah I, I'm glad you raised that it, it really is hard to know what an individual is experiencing inside mm -hmm. um, from what you see on the outside right suicide um, as well as any kind of emotional struggle really doesn't uh, discriminate it, it's prevalent in all racial ethnic groups it's prevalent in across socioeconomic strata so I really think uh, the key is to talk to people to pay attention to them um, and to reach out on their behalf and so there's help for families and there's also help for individuals talk about the family component because yeah. uh, that's major too yes absolutely um, you know when an individual is struggling with emotions uh, emotional issues um, it does impact their families it does impact their caregivers um, there are many resources um, for families including family resource centers some of which MHA our my parent organization operates um, where um, there are people that can support the family members, understand their needs, and help them navigate um, the system, which can be complex and it can be daunting, um, and connect their loved one with care, and also think about what supports do they need for themselves. And so for people who want more information, they can call what, 1-888-NYC, well, yep. and you can find out there. And uh, you said you can use a text and chat, and yes. those are, those are also things. We're 24-7, um, phone, text, or chat, and uh, it's available in a multiple plethora of languages. That's good. Well, Anita Iyer is here with us. She's the Vice President of Contact Center Services at the Mental Health Association of NYC. And uh, she's been our guest sharing a little bit about uh, suicide. As we said in the open, uh, when it comes to suicide, uh, it's actually the 10th leading cause. Is that right? Of uh, death. So one people to get connected if you can. And uh, thank you so much, Anita, for coming and sharing with thank us. Thank you for having me. All righty, take a quick break. But listen, when we come back, we'll have more show right after this. I'm only 17. But I know about investing. Believe in something, buy shares in it, watch it grow. So what if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. I could be one of the first college graduates from my family, the first philanthropist from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there's a second and a third. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney and I'm your dividend. This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. 
Sometimes he'll flap his arms again and again. One day, I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly, I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help. And slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help. And slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Well, if you're looking to expand your business, the South Bronx Overall Economic Corporation, also known as Sobro, is holding their annual business expo. Now, here to tell us more about the event and what the organization really has to offer for Bronx residents, we welcome now the Sobro Assistant Director, Andrew Hyman, and Sobro Assistant Vice President, Evangeline Hiliadola. Yes. Is that right? Yes. See, I get an A for Thank that. Thank you. There yes, you go. I'm so glad. So, everybody messes it up. <laughs> yes. I, try, I, I understand. They, they mess up Jaime, too. Don't Thank you be surprised. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Jaime, they mess it up, too, don't they? A lot. A lot. <laughs> well, we're glad we got the names correct. Listen, we're excited for you guys because when you talk about small business, obviously, it is the backbone for a lot that goes on here in the borough of the Bronx. And I know you got a gala coming up. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But if we can start, just talk a little bit about small business itself and its vitality. Well, small business is the economic engine of the city, and it's also the economic engine of the uh, South Bronx. We offer a wide variety of programs to assist small businesses in uh, their development. Uh, we have an entrepreneurial assistance program, which assists beginning entrepreneurs in getting their businesses started. We have a, um, an industrial business zones pro program. There are five of those in the city, in the uh, Bronx. We run all of them and we provide information about um, uh, various things such as incentives and benefits, tax benefits, mm -hmm. that you could get as a business. We ourselves are the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. We help small businesses with certification as minority and women-owned businesses by the City of New York and uh, New York State. Um, we also help them with uh, government contracting and procurement. Mm. Well, the certification is not just limited to the city and the state. We also help with the federal certification, which Procurement Technical Assistance Center is funded by Department of Defense mm -hmm. through Department of Logistic Agency to help businesses, small businesses, minority-owned, woman-owned, veterans, service-disabled veterans, to help them with government contracting process. As you know, it's so uh, difficult for small businesses. The process alone is so complicated right. and we're here to help them with that process at the same time we help them identify who's buying their products and services and we help them with the bidding process or uh, we help them you know craft their capability statements so they will be able to market what are some of the biggest challenges that you find uh, in terms of assisting small businesses or small businesses actually need these days financial capabilities you know they um, when you get a contract you know Sometimes they, they don't pay you right away. So, of course, you have to have uh, upfront capital to finance yeah, you and to pay your employees. So that's the biggest issue of the businesses here. Mm -hmm. You know, they have no financial capabilities. Yeah, and the businesses uh, here are mostly cash businesses, and mm -hmm. it's particularly difficult as a cash business um, to be able to get financing uh, from an institutional lender. Um, so we work hard with businesses in trying to develop their accounting systems and their uh, financial management, uh, s management systems. And we teach them about uh, the opportunity that uh, government con contracts bring uh, for business expansion as well. Yeah. 
And you guys have an expo and a gala coming up too, Yeah, huh? that's why we're here today. We wanted to uh, inform the public that Sobro, South Bronx Sobro, All Economic Development Corporation, we're hosting an event. It's a 19th, uh, our 19th annual Bronx Business Opportunities Expo. This is the opportunity for small business to showcase their products and services to the public. At the same time, you know, is to connect to the prime contractors. City agency, federal agency representatives are coming also at the same time so they can get information and to connect with them whatever is available procurement opportunities they may have. We also invite prime contractors so subcontractor can take advantage of uh, if there's any uh, available contracting opportunities. So what are people doing to become a part of this? Because you mentioned a whole, whole plethora of people that could actually are going to be there. What do they do to get connected? Well, they have to bring, you know, like business cards. You have to meet them in person because sometimes it's better to see to meet the um, representative in person, that way when you call, you can put a face, you know, like sometimes it's hard to connect with them because they're so busy at the same time. Mm -hmm. But if they meet them in person and they can talk about, you have to, they have to do like a business pitch, you know, like talk about your, what type of product services can you offer mm -hmm. to, uh, you know. Your pitch. Your right. pitch, yeah. To your basic 30 second pitch. Right. And, and if you, it, uh, a lot can happen in 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, and you can uh, say a lot in 30 seconds. Well, you can kill it in 30 seconds, too. Uh. That's true, too. <laughs> There's a lot of information that they can take with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, we also have, like, a workshop, you know, like, a uh, financing workshop or maybe selling to the government so mm -hmm. they can um, inform how to do business with different agencies. And, and you talked a little bit about government contracts and, and state contracts. and. Is the process, I know the process is, is getting a little bit more tougher with regulations and mandates. Are we finding that businesses are able to keep up with the necessary, with necessary changes in regulations and things? Well, one of the things we try to do is uh, help them to keep up mm. uh, with regulations by having uh, workshops. We have a couple of workshops um, a month on how to do business with uh, different agencies where the agencies themselves send people uh, to uh, speak. Uh, and to connect with the uh, small businesses that attend these workshops. The attendance is usually anywhere between 10 and 30 people listening uh, to how you can uh, procure contracts from the government. That's why we help them with this, uh, like for the small businesses, most of them cannot handle big projects. Mm -hmm. So that's why we help them with the minority certification, whatever certification they can take advantage, so they can take advantage of the percentage that goes to the minority and small business. Yeah, the MWBE, uh, I know that's a, big, uh, that's a big thing that goes across the state and, and minorities and uh, small uh, women in business uh, for contracting. Are we finding more are actually taking advantage of the MWBE program? Yes. We, um, most recently, we just finished uh, the, uh, the, uh, the community mayor. partnership program with yes. the uh, mayor's office, which uh, one of whose goals was to expand the uh, number of, uh, of uh, minority and women-owned uh, business enterprises that are certified uh, by the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, the city has done, I think, a very good job of um, publicizing this and uh, making these um, making uh, the knowledge of NWBE available to uh, small businesses. And so for people who want more information, of course, we want you to get connected to uh, Sobro. Let's talk about the date of the event again. It's September 7, mm -hmm. uh, nine, uh, September 7 to from 9.30 to 2 p.m. It's going to be at MCNY, the new campus in the Bronx, 459 East, 149 Street. That's in the heart of the Bronx. It's between uh, 149 and Westchester Avenue. Mm. And then in October, you got something as well, huh? Yeah, we had the uh, gala going on, um, our 45th gala. We started as an organization in 1972, mm -hmm. um, and we're celebrating our 45th uh, year in business. It's going to be from uh, 6 to 9 on October 4th at the New York Botanical Garden. Mm -hmm. When we look at the landscape of small business now, how have things changed recently? Well, the, like with many things, uh, the biggest, ch biggest change, I think, is uh, computers. It mm -hmm. uh, changes how uh, you how you run your business, it changes how you uh, market your business, um, and uh, getting those skills, particularly for accounting and financial management, are very important for small businesses today. Being flexible mm -hmm. and being able uh, to you know, make, your, uh, make your deadlines um, and to learn about uh, requests for proposals that are out that you can take advantage of um, is also, I think, um, uh, a way that businesses have ch business has changed. In, uh, 
in the early 21st century. Now, Evangeline, what should people know if they come through the door to come see you for technical assistance or if they just want to, you know, get some help? So a business, they have to be at least one year in business mm -hmm. and they file their taxes for the business and they have to have products and services that the government buy. So, you know, as you know, government buy almost everything from paper clips to the airplane. So, you know, <laughs> right. if you think you can sell to the government, we're here to help you. Uh, we're located at 555 Bergen Avenue, third floor. My name is Evangeline and Andrew. And it's not all, only our department. We also have MB, MBDA, Minority Business Center, that can help other stuff that we may not be able to provide. So Sobro is just a, like a one-stop shopping center. You, you come to Sobro and we have all types of services that we can provide to small businesses. Well, certainly we want people to take advantage of that. Small businesses, you said in the beginning, is of course the economic engine for it's the, the backbone of yeah, the economy. Of the economy here yeah. in the United States. So a strong uh, small business is a strong economy. So Yeah, take advantage of, guys, take advantage. It's free. We are non-for-profit and we've been providing these services for a long, long time. And we would love to see you at Sobro. All right, Evangeline, thank you so much. Andrew, thank you for coming and sharing with Pleasure. us. Pleasure. Thank Good you. Good to have you. Good to have you. And listen, Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our show today, and uh, that's about it. We want to thank our guests for joining us, but most of all, we want to thank you for watching. And uh, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Cable Vision Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, we're on Channel 33, or anytime, you can watch us on the web at bronxnet.org. For all of us here on the set of Open, Darren Hyman saying, take care, God bless, and keep this channel wide open. This is why you took a second job. Why you taught yourself how to fix the plumbing. Why you'll do whatever it takes to keep your home. And that is why we want to help. We are making home affordable, a free government resource that can make paying the mortgage easier. Call 888-995-HOPE today. They said I have troll teeth. That my voice sounded like a possessed baby doll. That no one would ever love someone as stupid as me. That I was fat. Ugly. Disgusting. The effect of bullying is potent. We will no longer be the silent majority. Now, when you see online bullying, there's something you can do about it. We're going to take action with the eye. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness. I am a witness, and so are you. neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart is a sea race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family.